Uh, we, our second panel uh, will be the two co-chairs of the Blue Ribbon National Academy of Sciences panel on AIDS. They're Dr. David Baltimore, Whitehead Institute at MIT, and Dr. Sheldon Wolf of Tufts University and the New England Medical Center. Dr. Baltimore chaired the panel on research. Dr. Wolf chaired the panel on education. We appreciate their being with us uh, here today. And uh, we would uh, understand about 20 seconds of restlessness, and then we're going to ask for uh, the room to be quiet so we can hear this very important testimony. We've got three panels, realistically a couple of probably two more hours available to us. We don't want to uh, uh, inhibit uh, the presentations, but we would hope we would uh, indicate to all our witnesses their statements will be filed in their entirety. Uh, we will try and shorten our questions and make them a little more precise, less wordy. Uh, but we'll tr try and move the along. We've got our next, uh, next uh, two panels, enormously interesting in terms of what's happening in the world, and then an update on what's happening in the vaccines, which is going to be, I think, uh, extremely important in rounding out our hearing. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Baltimore. I want to welcome them both uh, as a chairman of the committee and also personally. We're glad to have both of you here. Dr. Baltimore. My name is David Baltimore, and I'm director of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and professor of biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Nobel laureate in medicine. I co-chaired the study that produced the recent report confronting AIDS for the, Na the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. As part of that task, I also headed a panel on research needs and opportunities. I should like to emphasize certain points in our report. The speed and effectiveness with which, with which research on AIDS has been carried out has been phenomenal. The disease was first recognized in 1981, and within two years, the first report of a causative agent had appeared. There followed a veritable explosion of new information about the virus and the diseases it causes. This progress came about as a direct consequence of the many billions of dollars that the United States Congress has appropriated for basic research in biomedical science. It was a vindication of the long-standing recognition by committees such as this that we must learn all we can about life processes because we never know just what information is going to be relevant to coping with our health needs, a point that both of the senators have made very eloquently. The extraordinary success in identifying the agent and in devising a blood test for it has not been followed by great progress on the two fronts we care about most, production of a vaccine and development of an anti-AIDS drug. Let me describe a bit wherein the problems lie. AIDS is a, is a disease caused by a virus, but the virus has a peculiarity. It does not induce an effective antibody response. The consequence is that the virus continues to grow inexorably in contrast to the usual virus infections, which are limited by the body's production of antibody. A second consequence of the poor antibody response is that producing a vaccine is going to be very difficult because we will have to trick the virus rather than using our usual tactic of getting the virus to do the work for us. Drug development is going to be equally hard. No other virus disease has ever been cured by a, virus, uh, by a drug, although some have been held in check. Thus, we have the rare situation of a virus that does not stimulate the body's protective system, where artificial development of protection is probably going to require development of unprecedented strategies, and where drug treatment would be a unique achievement. Clearly, the AIDS virus poses a uniquely difficult problem to medical science, one to which we cannot expect to have a rapid response. In fact, the speed with which drugs of at least partial effectiveness have been found is amazing and quite gratifying. The research needed will require the commitment of the entire scientific community, inside government, in the academic world, and in private industry. A crucial part of the effort will be work with animals, particularly primates that provide the only useful models we have for understanding and developing treatments and prevention for the human disease. To get the involvement of everyone who has something to offer, we need many things. We need to upgrade facilities at universities and research institutes around the country. We need to bring together the private and public sectors. We need to encourage the free and rapid dissemination of research materials. We need to seek out the most innovative members of the scientific community and see that they become involved. We need to increase our efforts in basic immunology and virology to provide the information base for coping with the disease. We need to expand research on primates 
and to encourage more trained virologists and immunologists to become interested in primate research. All of this requires money, so we must be prepared for large research expenditures. On the other side, I think we should avoid tendencies to centralize efforts, to set up czars of research, or to tightly direct programs. Those tendencies stifle rather than encourage creativity. To optimally deal with the problems posed by the AIDS epidemic, the National Academy of Sciences and Institute of Medicine Committee made a series of recommendations. First, that we respond now by a massive educational program to limit high-risk activities because we cannot hope to soon enough protect people by a vaccine, and Dr. Wolf will comment further on that program. Second, that we commit ourselves to a long-term research program to find the strategy that will successfully produce a vaccine and to learn the secrets of the virus so that we can most effectively produce a drug, produce drugs. This effort we expect to require a billion dollars of research funds by 1990. Third, that we do not try to steal the money from, for this program from other biomedical research efforts because we need to be ready to cope with future health emergencies and we have many health problems to deal with other than AIDS. Fourth, that a national commission be established to oversee the anti-AIDS efforts because it requires integration of many sectors including industry, state and local government, and the federal government. This should be an ongoing commission that should also serve the necessary function of reporting to the American people periodically on the spread of AIDS and the prospects for control. Fifth, that the President exert personal leadership in the anti-AIDS campaign because a disease that will soon count its victims in the hundreds of thousands is a national catastrophe. Sixth, that the United States play a major role in efforts to understand and curbs a curb AIDS internationally because of the enormous magnitude of the problem, especially in Africa, because we have much to learn about how AIDS is spread from studying the problem abroad, and because of the United States' traditional role as leader in world health efforts. Thank you. Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sheldon Wolf. I'm the chairman of the Mayor, Department of Medicine. Hold that mic just more directly in front of you. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, my name is Sheldon Wolf. I'm the chairman of the Department of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and physician in chief of the New England Medical Center. One of my responsibilities as chairman of the IOM study on AIDS was to chair a panel that examined matters of health care and public health, including public education, entailed in stemming the epidemic of AIDS and the spread of the viral infection that causes it. The urgency of the situation is only portrayed by the official reports of a relentless increase in cases of AIDS that we've heard this morning repeatedly on the numbers of patients both infected and suffering with AIDS in this country today. Most persons uh, with AIDS can be expected to die within two years. Uh, hardly any survive past the third year. The larger dimension of the damage is that these victims are only a small proportion of the people already infected with this virus. A very much larger population, however, is not infected with the AIDS virus, even though some of them are in high-risk groups for infection. These are the people who must be reached by a massive and continuing public education campaign to teach them how to avoid infection. Such a campaign was a central recommendation of our study. We found that education offered the only hope of slowing the spread of the virus over the years that we expect it will take to devise an effective AIDS vaccine or therapeutic agent. Education as we mean it includes inducing, persuading, and otherwise motivating people to avoid transmission of the virus. The message must be as direct as required to impress the target audiences of the peril of the infection and how to avoid it. Target groups include homosexual men, intravenous drug users, sexually active heterosexuals, and adolescents. Whatever vernaculars it takes to reach them are the languages that educators must employ. Our committee expressed disappointment in past federal education efforts against AIDS. In fact, we described it as woefully inadequate. However, we were pleased to see the report of the U.S. Surgeon General on AIDS, which was released shortly before our report, and believe that it is a step in the right direction. Along with the education campaign, we recommended other public health measures, including an expanded program of testing for infection that is both voluntary and confidential, stronger efforts in treatment and prevention of intravenous drug use, and experiments in furnishing sterile needles and syringes to intravenous drug users. All told, the education and public health measures that we recommended 
we estimated would cost approximately $1 billion a year by the end of 1990. However, those expenditures are to be shared amongst federal, state, local, and private sources. An idea of the expenses that can mount up to $1 billion a year is given by only a few examples. Testing for infection, including counseling, is estimated to cost approximately $40 per person. 20 million people in this country need to be tested as a conservative estimate. The five states leading in spending for AIDS prevention have gone through $117 million in two years, but have had to tap other state health programs to raise the money. Advertising will be needed to push the message of prevention. Conceivably, we may have to spend as much as it costs to launch a new laundry detergent, which is approximately 50 to $60 million. These figures pale, however, in comparison with the cost of caring for AIDS patients and persons afflicted with other expressions of the virus. The yearly cost of care for AIDS patients at present is estimated to be between twenty dollars and $60,000, while the lifetime cost per AIDS case is seen to range from fifty dollars to $150,000 per patient. Thus, one could estimate, as was mentioned earlier this morning, that it will cost between eight to $16 billion in 1991 just to care for patients with AIDS. Against such figures, the investment value of preventing each new AIDS case is a huge bargain. The high cost of care for AIDS patients already has grievously burdened hospitals and other facilities in some urban centers with a large number of cases. Similar problems can be expected in the next few years to engulf facilities not familiar with AIDS. They will need the advice of those who have learned which techniques of care work best. Our committee found the most appropriate care emphasized community-based services that keep hospitalization to a minimum. We already see our recommendations reflected in the recent Massachusetts decision to fund home care for AIDS, which may be the first such action in the nation. International problems with AIDS and infection by its virus have yet to provoke an adequate response from the United States. Particularly in developing nations, and especially in the nations of Central Africa, the rate of infection with the virus is reportedly as great as 10 percent. Such an involvement with such a dread disease imperils not only further development of these struggling countries, but also the very survival of their most deprived subpopulations. These countries have so few health resources that they cannot begin to cope with AIDS unless the United States joins in research to benefit them and, consequently, us. We also should support the newly expanded AIDS program of the World Health Organization. It was our recommendation that by 1990, our total commitment to international efforts should total at least $50 million a year on a continuing basis. Thank you.